Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Power Core Productions and Podcastings, where in today's video we are going to be continuing Naruto Polaris Shippuden, What If Hanabi Hyuga Was Born First, Part 9. But as always, if you are new to the channel, or if you're a regular and you like what we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Where we last left off with our series, we now started to enter into the Shippuden aspect of our story. With two and a half years time now passing, Naruto has grown not only in power but in wisdom, along with other members of his generation, as well as new faces who had never before made it into the Shippuden story, now getting some of their own shine. With Naruto and the new Team 7 now put together, they now face their first upcoming test, that being the rescue of the Kazekage Gara who has been taken by the Akatsuki in an attempt to steal the One Tails. How will Naruto and Team 7 fare in their first mission outing facing off against the Akatsuki duo of Sasori and Daedara? And what more so will be of this team's fate as now more darker elements start to take form and work from the shadows? For all this and more, stay tuned as we now continue. Naruto Polaris Shippuden, What If Hanabi Hyuga Was Born First, Part 9. As always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Following the attack on the Sand Village, and with the Akatsuki making their move, having kidnapped Gara the Kazekage, as well as the One Tails Chinchuriki, where it would be sent immediately back to the Hidden Leaf to aid and require for their assistance, as well as to inform Tamari, who was in the Hidden Leaf at the time for the tuning exams of the impending plight of her village, and to summon her back at once. By the time Ward had gotten to the Hidden Leaf, Tsunade would have Team 7 summoned to her office. Naruto and Dosu would arrive, the two of them bickering a bit as Dosu wasn't really too fond of his roommate. You see, following Dosu's probation, he needed a place to stay, and Naruto was selected to be his home, at least until he found some better living arrangements down the line. Of course, it wasn't that Naruto was a bad roommate, but it was just that the two were different in a lot of ways. Naruto was a lot more outgoing while Dosu tried to keep things to himself. It wasn't really like he was trying to be friends with anyone in Team 7 right now anyway. Dosu just wanted to do his part and have his own freedom. Of course, since he had come over to the side of the Hidden Leaf and was now working as a shinobi for the Leaf Village, he was still trying to gain the trust of those in the higher ups. Thankfully, he had had training and worked under Kakashi for the last two and a half years, but even still, he knew that it would take some time. After all, he was a part of the village that attacked theirs during the Konoha Crush, even if he wasn't directly involved, and he knew that there would be much misgivings as he was still a former servant of Orochimaru. But even still, Dosu took this in stride believing that, in time, he'd find his own way in life, one separate from that of his former master. In the meanwhile, Kakashi and Hanabi would arrive as well, and the team would be given their briefing, along with Tamari who was brought along to be informed of what happened to her brother. They would be told to pack their things and to set off for the Hidden Sand Village. Naturally, Hanabi would run into some issue, mainly coming from her father as well as other members of the Hyuga clan, who weren't too keen on her going out of the village, especially with Naruto. You see, the Hyuga clan were very protective of those in the main household and of those of the main branch, and when Hanabi was injured in her fight against Sasuke during the Sasuke retrieval arc of two and a half years ago, 
It was a lot of the shouldering blame that was placed upon Naruto, who was the acting Chunin commander at the time. Also, there were some who suspected that Hanabi might harbor feelings towards Naruto. Even though Naruto's name was slowly starting to grow and gain some notoriety, there was still the worry of Naruto being the social pariah that he was, and the unneeded headache that might come from being associated with him. Outside of team missions and village responsibilities, the clan tried to limit how much time the two spent together. But since Naruto had been gone for two and a half years, there wasn't really so much to worry about. Except now, as soon as he came back, they found that their next heir to the Hyuga clan was being involved in something that they really felt she shouldn't be. Also, because of her ties to Sasuke, and for them being aware of what he had done, he was not looked upon too favorably either. If the Hyuga clan could have it their way, they wanted to have Hanabi removed from all association with Team 7, and basically allow her to focus on her main duties here with the Hyuga. However, Tsunade would overrule this, making it very clear that she couldn't play favorites when it came to missions and assignments, and the simple fact of the matter was that Hanabi was one of the shinobi best suited for this mission. To not do so simply to favor one clan over another wouldn't set a good precedent for her tenure as Hokage. And if it made her feel better, Neji was out with Team Guy on a mission so she could send them over as backup. With Neji being a member of the side branch, him backing up Hanabi would give them some reason for comfort. After thinking this over and agreeing with the logic, they would allow Hanabi to go, although they would still have their skepticism about them. In the meantime, Team 7 along with Tamari would set off at once, racing at top speeds to make their way to the Sand Village, which would take around 2.5 to 3 days, the same as in canon. For the most of the part, the story would remain about the same up until the point of their arrival to the Hidden Sand, as Hanabi would get to work on healing Kankuro and saving him from the deadly poison he had suffered from his fight against Sasori. Now, one key element for Hanabi that she would have in her favor that Sakura wouldn't would be her Byakugan. Having trained with Tsunade in medical ninjutsu, Hanabi had studied and learned many functions of the human body. The Byakugan, being able to perceive inside of the human body, would give her a leg up when it came to her medical ninjutsu, more so than any other student that Tsunade had ever trained. Because of this, Hanabi could use her Byakugan to find and locate where the poison was exactly inside of the human body. Using a technique similar to what Sakura did to heal Kankuro and remove the poison from his body, but with even more precision given her skills with the gentle fist technique, it only amplified her medical ninjutsu further, allowing her to save Kankuro much more effectively as she went to work on finding a cure for the poison and creating the proper antidotes. In the meanwhile, Granny Chio, one of the Sand Elders, would still go on to attack Kakashi. However, she would be stopped by both Naruto and Dosu who would fend her off. Like in the original, Chio would learn that Kakashi was not in fact the White Fang of the Hidden Leaf, but was the son of the White Fang the shinobi from the Hidden Leaf Village's Second Great Ninja War, who was responsible for the death of her son and her daughter-in-law, as well as being the parents of those who were killed, that being of Sasori. Even still, most part of the story would remain the same all up until this point. Hanabi would still go on to make the cures, and Kankuro would still give the piece of cloth that he had taken from his fight with Sasori, thus allowing them to track down the Akatsuki duo with Kakashi using his ninja hounds. Like before, Chio would offer to go in place of Tamari, to aid in the capture or defeat of Sasori, as well as the return of Gara the Kazekage. As the group were going about their tracking to hunt for the Akatsuki, Chio would learn of Naruto's connection to Gara. Through Hanabi, she would learn of Naruto being the Nine Tails Chinchuriki, and how he too felt a strong connection towards Gara 
because he viewed them as the same. But for Naruto, this started giving him flashbacks. You see, Naruto being a Chunin in this timeline means that he had to learn to take things a lot more serious and a lot more in stride. Naruto now had to feel the weight of commanding others under him and suffering the potential loss. And the even crazier fact was that he still didn't know the full details of what everyone had gone through during this mission. For one, he was not made aware of the fact that Hanabi had actually been run through by a Chidori, only narrowly evading it enough so that it didn't strike her vital spots. The reason why Naruto had not been informed about this, and why Hanabi made sure to hide the scar on her chest, was because she didn't want Naruto to feel any worse than she knew he already did. You see, during the Sasuke retrieval arc, as both Naruto and Hanabi had fought against Kimimaru, when Sasuke awoke from his coffin and made the run for it, a choice was made at that exact time. Either Naruto or Hanabi would have to chase him down. And before Naruto could even make the decision, Hanabi already started moving after him, believing that she was better suited to face off against the Hyuga as she had the Byakugan. And while she was able to fight him well enough, Sasuke was ultimately able to do just enough to escape from her. Naruto not being fully debriefed on all of the injury that Hanabi had taken, he still knew she suffered greatly. And Naruto did not want the same for those that he cared about. He wanted to save those whom he believed were his friends no matter what. And as such, it meant that Naruto wanted to rescue Gara by any means. Unknown to the two though, Dosu was listening intently. Hearing more about Naruto, more about what happened with Gara and Konoha Crush, he slowly started to gain a higher form of respect and appreciation for Naruto. He might have been an idiot and a dope at times, but he was someone that was loyal and cared for his friends, something that he admired as a quality, as he remembered his comrades in Zaku and Ken, and hearing of their unfortunate deaths and how they were used in the reanimation jutsu for the first and second Hokage. It filled him with more rage and anger than anything else. The fact that Orochimaru could do such a thing to his comrades. The fact that they had been used as pawns in his game. That they were nothing more but mere obstacles to test his precious Sasuke. It filled Dosu with a stronger sense of anger than he had ever felt in a long time. It's why he trained as hard as he did. He remembered his fight against Sasuke in the tuning exams and how he just narrowly had managed to win. Deep down, he wanted another shot, but not just to defeat Sasuke, but to prove to Orochimaru that he was foolish in his thinking, to place all of his hopes into the Uchiha. He would leave the Uchiha broken at Orochimaru's feet, and he would show him the foolishness of his ways. In the meantime, the team would remain focused, as just as in canon, both Team Kakashi and Team Guy would be intercepted by Itachi and Kisame respectively. Unlike in the original timeline, Team Kakashi would work a lot more effectively against Itachi, while Team Guy would still face off against Kisame the same way that they had done like before. Although once the Akatsuki duo were defeated, it would be revealed to them that they were not the real Itachi and Kisame, but they were merely clones that had a small percentage of the original chakra. They were nothing more but glorified distractions to try to throw them off long enough for the Akatsuki to continue their extraction. Before long, as they made it to the hideout of the two Akatsuki duo that they had been hunting, Team Guy would remove the seals around the base trapping them within a new former barrier as they would have to fight clones of themselves. And in the meantime, Team Kakashi would confront the two Akatsuki members. Naruto feeling himself starting to rise and seethe in anger as he saw Deidara sitting upon 
the hapless body of Gara. Naruto would immediately charge towards Deidara, as he used one of his creations of clay, the C2 Dragon, taking the body of Gara and attempting to escape, as both Naruto and Kakashi would chase after him. Within the cave in the meanwhile, we would be privy to our first fight, Hanabi, Dosu, and Chio versus Sasori. This matchup would prove to be far more advantageous for Sasori than in the original timeline. For one, fighting against Hanabi, someone who was now skilled with the usage of medical ninjutsu as well as enhanced strength via chakra, along with the other skills that we know that Sakura had gained in the original timeline, along with the ability to use the Byakugan, meant that all of Sasori's tricks were exploited. He couldn't try to hide or evade, or try to sneak them with a puppet attack from behind. The Byakugan was able to see through everything. Of course, this didn't mean that Sasori was a weakling, not by any means. The Hiroko puppet shell that he used to protect himself was not easily broken, and even the strength of the third Kazekage was something that could not easily be fought off. But still, using Hanabi's own natural skill, the black sand colliding with her lightning style static rotation, the rotation jutsu used by the Hyuga but imbued with lightning chakra was proving to be a good counter towards the Iron Sand. There was also Chio, who was effective with her skill in puppetry, being able to move both Dosu and Hanabi in the right position. But the key factor to this fight was none other than Dosu of all people, as his skill with sound ninjutsu proved to be a detriment towards Sasori. Even if Sasori had turned his whole body into a puppet, meaning that he was able to fight off against what he viewed as weakness. Sound was still something that cannot easily be overcome. For one, Sasori would use one of his jutsu, Sound Style Echo Confusion, as he would throw out different sounds all throughout the cave, Sasori attacking different spots where he believed Chio, Hanabi, or Dosu were only to find that there was nothing there. He was being tricked by false sound, and Hanabi and Chio would work to defeat him. Seeing Dosu as the potential threat, Sasori would focus his attentions on trying to take him out. Of course, for Sasori, in terms of overall power, at this point in time, he was stronger, and going after the weak one first seemed like the easiest of options. As they continued on in their battle, Dosu would find himself being run through by a blade that was drenched in Sasori's poison. Dosu would immediately fall to the ground, laying there lifeless. Hanabi yelled out in horror as she coated herself in lightning chakra as the crackles of the lightning style overdrive level 3 would overtake her in that moment. She would let off a massive lightning style stag rotation, knocking away as many of Sasori's puppets as possible, forcing him to go onto the retreat, as she would use a gentle fist air palm strike, striking him directly in the chest and breaking away his entire puppet body. Believing now that she had lost a comrade, Hanabi could feel her rage boiling, and even Chio was impressed by Hanabi's skill, her speed allowing her to keep up with many of the puppets for someone who was not versed in puppet style ninjutsu. Sasori now found himself on the back burner. This Hanabi was proving to be more than what he had bargained for, and with his grandmother Chio, it meant that he was going to have to try he didn't like to use his secret techniques, but it seemed as though he had no choice. He would unleash the red secret technique 100 puppets. As he opened the compartment in his chest, a hundred puppet strings would appear along with the hundred red cloth puppets that he had used. 
They were famed for taking down an entire country. Chio would respond in kind by using the Chikamatsu collection, the 10 legendary puppets, along with Hanabi, who didn't need to be controlled by Chio, as she was fast and agile enough to fight off Sasori's puppets. The two sides would collide, Chio's 10 puppets using combination techniques, Hanabi using her Byakugan to fend off puppets from every direction, and Sasori trying his best to pick them off. He would look over for a moment and still see the body of Dosu lying on the ground. It seemed as though they didn't have a way to counter his poison, as the body still lied there. However, if one were to take a closer look at that body, then you would see that it was not what you would think it was. But that was something that Sasori would have to learn at a later point in time as he continued to overwhelm both Hanabi and Chio. Two puppets in particular made their way, as Chio were fending off many of the puppet enemies, the puppets that resembled Sasori's mother and father, would flank Chio from either side, both with poison tipped swords, ready to impale and kill her. Hanabi yelled for Chio to move out of the way, but it seemed as though it were too late. Sasori felt as though Hanabi wasn't going to get there in time. Sasori gloated that in the end, the old, the frail, and the weak would always fall to those that would live forever. However, before he could finish his statement, the blade of the Hatake sword passed down from the White Fang to Kakashi and now to Dosu would find itself ran straight through the heart of Sasori. As Sasori slowly turned his head, he would feel a discharge of sound release ninjutsu, causing his heart to explode in that moment as all of his puppets would fall to the ground. As he turned his head, he would see alive and well Dosu. But how you were dead? That's just what I wanted you to think. I know that in the end I was the weak link to this three man team, but we had counters for your poison. Even still, I had to make use of this trick since I knew I wasn't going to get a second chance. But I didn't even... You didn't hear me? Hmm. I figured you wouldn't. This is the use of my sound style, Ultimate Silence. Using my chakra, I'm able to erase all sound made from my body. I could step on a thousand crunching leaves and you'd still never hear me. We use a random puppet that was destroyed as a fake, allowing you to think that you had actually killed me. While Hanabi and Chio were fighting off your main focuses, I was keeping in the shadows, waiting and moving all the way around until an opening came to mind. At first, I had believed that Hanabi had killed you when she broke you apart. And thankfully, I didn't reveal myself, because we were able to see that your body had been brought back, and as well, that the only part of you that was human that allowed you to use chakra was your heart. Once I had a target, the only thing left to do was to wait until I got close enough, and then I could take you out. I see. You sound are very impressive. It reminds me a lot of him. Of him? Orochimaru. What do you know about Orochimaru? He was once my partner. What? Hanabi would say. Your partner? In the Akatsuki? Did you not know? 
They had heard little of Orochimaru's past. Of course, it wasn't made public knowledge that Orochimaru had been a part of the Akatsuki, but even still to learn of this revelation. But Sasori would have much more to give. Seeing as how they had defeated him, they deserved a reward. It seemed learning more about Orochimaru was what this hidden leaf shinobi cared for. As such, he gave them the details that in 10 days time from now, he was going to be meeting with a spy, a spy who had been working for him to follow Orochimaru closely. The location would be Tenchi Bridge. Dosu and Hanabi would be shocked by this news. To actually know of where a spy who had been looking after Orochimaru, to know where and when he was going to be at, this was something that the Hidden Leaf definitely needed. In the meantime, Naruto and Kakashi would continue their pursuit as they chased after Daedara. Daedara continued to antagonize Naruto, believing that taking down Shinchuriki was an easy feat and not anything he'd have to worry about. Naruto continued to hold his composure as he and Kakashi had to figure out a way to deal with Daedara. Thankfully, with Kakashi's Sharingan, they were able to see through the clay-style jutsu that Daedara used. Kakashi using his Sharingan, he was able to see how it worked, seeing as how he used it like a bomb. And Naruto, now knowing about the dangers he was facing, would have to figure out a way to counter it. While flying on the C2 Dragon, Daira would attempt to shoot out a bunch of small bombs towards Naruto. Naruto would counter as he created three Shadow Clones, each one emptying out their contents of Shuriken as all three clones would yell. Ninja Art, Shadow Clone Tripod Style, Shadow Shuriken Flurry Times Three. Naruto and his Shadow Clones would run through the hand signs before immediately their shurikens would multiply, doubling, then tripling, then quadrupling in number. The shurikens colliding with the bombs as it caused a major explosion within the sky, causing everything to be smoky and for Daedara to be unable to see where the Naruto's were coming from. Your dragon isn't all that great. I'll show you the power of a true dragon. Wind style, wind dragon jutsu. Within the smoke, a large wind dragon would come hurling towards Daedara, destroying one of the clay dragon's arms and causing him to lose direction in his flight. Kakashi, who was following from down below, allowing for his jutsu to charge, would watch as his eye morphed from its regular to the Mangekyo Sharingan. As he got a good look at Daedara, he would snap away his right arm. Daedara yelling in pain, as now he had to fight through what he was feeling, as well as not having control over his clay dragon. However, Naruto wasn't done, as immediately from behind him, Naruto would look to make another strike. However, before he could pull out his sword, Daedara, using his one good arm, would spit out tiny spiders that would hit Naruto in the face. Naruto would yell as he fell off, Daedara making one hand sign as he yelled, Ninja Art, Instant Explosion Jutsu. Immediately, Naruto's face would explode, Kakashi yelling as he thought he had seen Naruto get his head blown off. Ha! <laughs> The Nine Tails isn't all that special. Just like the One Tails. You're all talk, all bark and no bite. You wanna bet? Wait, what? Daedara looked down to see that the Naruto he had killed was nothing more but a clone, and that the real Naruto had managed to use a substitution jutsu before eventually getting behind him. Now amped up with the power of the Nine Tails, Naruto would unsheathe his sword 
and slice directly across the abdomen of Daedara, imbuing it with wind chakra to be cut even more deeper and a lot more sharper. Daedara would feel as though he had been sliced in half. Naruto would feel satisfaction from the swipe of the blade. However, Daedara's body would instantly morph into clay as it was revealed that it had been a clay clone this whole time. Seeing the danger of his situation, Naruto would cut away at the tail of the dragon, grabbing hold of Gara's body before using the wind style gale palm to push both he and Gara away. Kakashi would use his Mangekyo Sharingan once again, using the Kamui, he would send away the whole exploding dragon, warping it to another dimension before the explosion could occur. In the meantime, Daedara was still trying to recover from losing an arm, and from using the substitution, as if he hadn't done it when he did, he would have been sliced in half. He debated his options, should he continue to try to fight with the Ninetales? He had already lost the body of Gara, but the Akatsuki had accomplished their goal. He would use the Headhunter Jutsu and hide underground, hoping to get far enough away before eventually rendezvousing and making his escape. The Akatsuki had won and gotten what they had needed for now, so this would be a fight for another day. From here, the story would remain about the same as it was in canon. Naruto would still mourn the loss of Gara, and now with Dosu and Hanabi by his side, his friends would try to comfort him. But for Naruto, he felt as though he had lost once more. He was supposed to be a shinobi that was maturing, one that was supposed to lead by example, and yet it seemed as though in a second mission where he felt like everything was on the line, he had failed once again. However, Chio would take Naruto's hand. He would take the hand of Chio. As the two of them held over the body of Gara, Chio would use the life transfer jutsu, giving her own to save his, as she was moved by the kindness of Naruto. And seeing how well these Leaf Shinobi have fought, she believed that there might be hope for this new generation yet. She looked to Naruto and told him to be proud, to hold his head up high, telling him that as a Shinobi, they must be ones that endure and ones that move forward into the future. With the sacrifice of her life, Gara would be brought back. And as Gara was now rejoined in the world of the living, everyone would take a moment of silence as they prayed for the sacrifice of Granny Chio. After a few days, Gara would make a slow but speedy recovery. Even without the power of the Nut One Tails at his possession, he still planned to serve as Kazekage. And Naruto, along with Team Kakashi and Team Guy, would make their way back to the Hidden Leaf. As they did so, Dosu and Hanabi would pull Naruto aside and ask him about how his fight went, as well as giving a recap of theirs. But most importantly, they would tell him some information that was much needed. That in 10 days time, there was going to be a rendezvous at Tenchi Bridge. This concludes Naruto Polaris Shippuden What If Hanabi Hyuga Was Born First? Part 9 As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned for tomorrow's video as we continue Naruto The Tale of Two Sages What If Naruto Was Luis's Familiar? Part 7 But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. 
signing off, and I'll see you next time.